Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast from Altos Research. This is the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the trends shaping the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. For almost four years now, we've been sharing our, our latest market data every week in our weekly Altos Research video series. With the Top of Mind podcast, we are looking to add context to the discussion about what's happening in the market from leaders in the industry. Every week, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country. We track all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. People desperately need to know what's happening in the housing market right now. The market was frozen solid, then it turned around a little bit last year, then the fourth quarter was kind of crazy again this year, but the landscape is changing again now after the new year. And if you need to communicate about this market to your clients, go to altosresearch.com and just book a free consult with our team. We'll review your local market and how you can use market data in your business. All right, let's get to the show. I have, a, I have a great guest today, a returning guest, Selma Hap. Selma is the chief economist for CoreLogic, the largest provider of advanced property and ownership and analytics uh, and data-enabled services in, in real estate. Selma leads the economics team, which is responsible for analyzing, interpreting, forecasting, housing, and economic trends in real estate, mortgage, and insurance. Selma has had senior roles at Pack Union, uh, Trulia, the California Association of Realtors, the National Association, and uh, was also a special uh, research assistant at uh, at HUD. So uh, she's obviously in the media commenting on housing frequently, um, and she notably received uh, the Housing Wire Women of Influence Award in 2022. Uh, Selma is one of the top experts on what's happening in the housing economy right now. CoreLogic has remarkable data to build on. And so we're going to talk about what CoreLogic knows. We're going to talk about 2024. We're going to talk about all of the signals we know right now and see what we can learn about the housing market. So Selma, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so much for having me back. So, you know, most of our listeners know CoreLogic. Uh, but why don't you give us, for those who don't either know CoreLogic and, and you and your journey, give us a little bit. I gave a little bit of your, your cred, your street cred, but, but uh, give us a little bit of your background so we know what we're talking about here. Sure. So I've spent the last, um, I want to say it's coming on four years at CoreLogic. Um, one interesting thing uh, in my career, I started at CoreLogic on March 17, 2020, which was the shutdown day. So um, it's, you know, you know, ever since I started at CoreLogic, the housing market has been on a roller coaster ride. Um, so very uh, interesting perspective, you know, to gain from that. But um, before CoreLogic, I was with Pack Union, as you mentioned. I was with Pack Union for four years, so I spent a lot of time. Um, all, um, arming realtors, uh, real estate agents, uh, brokers, and also MLS executives with um, sort of trends in the housing market to help them um, inform their clients and 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 learn, have talking points uh, with their clients on what ha what is happening in the housing, what was happening in the mar housing market at the time. Um, the the PAC union was later bought by by P Compass, um, so m m more people probably know about Compass maybe than PAC union, but um, then before that I was a chief economist at Trulia. Um, Trulia is more consumer oriented um, group, so so we were trying to inform consumers on the you know um, benefits and advantages or. Uh, hurdles in home ownership. Um, and then before that, I was with the um, California Association of Realtors and National Association of Realtors. So I've spent a lot of times with realtors um, and trying to understand, you know, their point of view. Um, and so, and, you know, going into uh, at HUD, I was actually at the time also working on my dissertation. Actually, my dissertation came out of my work that uh, I did at HUD. And um, I was at University of Maryland um, at the time. There was a program called uh, Smart Growth Program, and so we sort of tried to, um, you know, look at uh, land use practices to ensure that growth is sustainable and, um, 
you know, does not lead to sprawl and, you know, con you know, traffic congestion and everything else that, that you know, results from spr <laughs> sprawl. But it seems as though we are today back to the same questions, you know, with just people moving out to more uh, exurban areas, more rural areas. So, so I feel like I've done a 360 uh, circle here in terms of the questions we look at um, about the overall sort of built environment. So... Yeah, and uh, and I was a real estate agent myself for a couple of years. <laughs> that was in Florida in 2004, so that was super interesting time to be in the housing market. As you recall, everything that was happening, you know, the movie, um, what was that movie? The um, Big Short? Yes. I mean, I felt like I lived through that whole <laughs> uh, oh, experience. Yeah, yeah. and... Um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about me. <laughs> that's a great that, that's a, a a great story and actually provides a lot of context. And there's um I, I guess I don't remember you saying before that that March 17, 2020 was your start day with CoreLogic, but man, what a what a momentous day for housing and for understanding the the real estate market. And you know, it's funny because we started this uh my the video series not the podcast but like doing weekly videos on the on the national data at that exact same time because i assumed and everybody assumed that the housing market was going to crash the sh shutdown was going to crash and and we were and so we were three weeks in and i was like guys people are buying houses Th it was three weeks of crash before recovery started. And, and so um, it really, that moment is really a powerful, I think, communication about like what the reason that we're doing this conversation now, right? There are things to pay attention to in the data that surprise us. Um, and so I am very much looking forward to talking about what you're surprised about and what you're looking for this year. Um, and interestingly, on the, the land use and your dissertation and the smart growth um, uh, approach, that's Obviously, as you point out, like a uh, momentous changes during the pandemic, we like broad demographic and um, migration pattern changes. Um, and and I'm I, maybe later on we have time. We'll circle back to it and and talk about if there are things that we can see now, 2024, uh, are that changing again. But let's start with 2023. So it's not January 2024. Um, let's look back for a minute. Uh, what surprised you about the year and what, what didn't surprise you? Well, I'd say that the year was full of surprises. <laughs> um, and I think what surprised me the most, and I guess what caught everybody by surprise, was the interest rate hike increase, right? Um, I, I think going into 2023, um, you know, if you recall mortgage rates peaking in, in November of 2022 and then starting, I mean, the situation is almost exactly the same today. You know, it, it peaked at the end of the year, it started coming down and, you know, we had so much, uh, momentum going into 2023 and then, and then the banking crisis happened and not that that was the reason for what happened um, subsequently to mortgage rates, but, but it did, you know, it, mortgage rates did end up going much higher. And so it really, you know, locked. And so as a result of that, you know, the lock-in effect that we ended up seeing in terms of supply was also, I think, something we were not necessarily planning for. Uh, you know, overall, when you think about what the forecasts were for 2023 was for home sales and activity to, you know, return to some level of normalcy after those roller coaster years of 2020 to 2022. Uh, but in fact, we ended up, you know, finding new bottoms over and over again. <laughs> um, you know, not so much for home prices, which was another surprise, right? We didn't think that home prices were going to remain as steady or in some markets rebound as much as they did. So, you know, we ended up, we, you know, at CoreLogic got a lot of heat at the beginning of the year for our forecast for home prices, but actually our forecast turned out to be pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty solid, you know, um, you know, just given, you know, everything else that happening and how everything else in the market played out. Um, I what was your forecast at the beginning of 2023 for home prices? 
Was it a positive year? I, it it was seemed a positive, to... Yeah, it was a positive year. I think it was very low uh, rate overall, maybe two or three percent increase in home prices. Um, but but it was positive, whereas a lot of folks were, you know, uh, forecasting declines in home declines. Prices. And so, what went into that uh, forecast that made you say? Up year, even if it's you know two or three percent, which is basically exactly where prices landed. So, what went into that forecast? Well, I think uh, one important thing was inventories. We saw inventories. If you remember, at the end of 2022, inventories basically collapsed. There was nothing. You know, everything. Well, in some market, in, in many markets, it collapsed. Um, yeah. You know, and then so so we were you know, and then you know, we we knew we were sort of start the new new home construction um you know and and i think what the other thing we saw is a lot of people were employed right people when people are employed they spend money they can buy homes and you know the the rate of unemployment at that uh point was still flirting be, below four percent i, I want to say that's when it hit three point we were like 3.6, if I'm remembering now, it's been, you know, it's, it seems like it's so long ago, I can't even yeah. remember where, uh, where, um, where unemployment was, but, you know, people were uh, employed uh, and they, you know, everybody who wanted in, in a sense, you know, got a better job. You know, when you looked at the number of people that transitioned into, uh, into new jobs, I think, you know, more than half of um, working population got a new job during the pandemic. And so, so that really helped with uh, with consumer purchase power, right? So, so that was another thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, overall, I think the fundamentals were strong. I think what we were worried about was the impact of mortgage rates on on affordability, which you know, it, you know. And the other thing is too, I think what the, you know, I keep talking about tale of two markets throughout this year because that's really what it was. You know, we 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 had enough inventory uh, for some folks who had a lot of income and a lot of cash, not so much for those folks who were income constrained. Um, you know, and 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 so you know, so some could buy, the others couldn't buy, and and so that's an unfortunate reality of of today's housing market. That's amazing. So. Uh, okay, so going into 2023, you were um, uh, you the forecast was for a two or three percent home price um, uh, increase for the year, and and by the Altos data, home prices increased like 2.6 percent for the year. Like it is that's exactly where where and and so you using things like inventory and, and employment and like the those things that that came into that. Okay, so that's useful. And at that time, that was a pretty strong call because most people were calling for a down year in prices, and some were calling for a big down year in prices. So, uh, all right, given that you are so good at forecasting. <laughs> Tell me about your 2024 forecast. I give all the credit to to the team at, at CoreLogic. I, I, I'm i just the, the messenger. <laughs> but um, yeah, so for, for our forecast for 2024, we do uh, have another couple to 3% increase in home prices. In our data, actually, home price was a little bit stronger for 2023. It, it ended up at, at, at about 4% on average. Um, but, but I think that's, you know, just a matter of like, how do you weight data, which markets you weight more than others? You know, that's always the difference between different home price indices. But, um, so, so some, some slowing in a sense, because not 4%, but a 3% increase in home prices. Okay, um, okay. so we do see that, you know, I do think it's going to vary again by market. Um, so, you know, when we see, when we say home prices are strong, they, they weren't strong everywhere. Um, some markets are still resetting or have yet to really reset from the declines that we've seen um, at the end of 2022. I'm thinking specifically of um, Austin and, and, for example, Boise, uh, some Idaho markets. You know, they're still, uh, I think that was, they overshot during the, the pandemic. The biggest boom markets. Yeah. The biggest yeah. pandemic boom markets. Yep. Yeah. So we do have some resetting going on in some markets. But, but what was interesting to me so far or coming into the end of this year into 2024 is some of the markets, some of the newcomers in terms of home price appreciation, like New England markets, you know, we, we, you know, when, you know, I started talking about um, my, my, my dissertation and at the time I was 
um, interested in repopulation of urban centers and, you know, which were growth, urban growth areas. And, you know, we saw a lot of people leaving, uh, you know, particularly then the Rust Belt, but also um, New England regions. And now we see people coming back to those regions, you know, and, and so I think that's an interesting development. And so we've, we are seeing a lot of home price appreciation in those markets too. Um, and then, then, you know, there are markets that uh, had seen resets, but maybe undershot in terms of resets and now are, are you know, rebalancing again. And, and like SoCal, for example, or Phoenix, Las Vegas. I mean, there, there are surprise markets to me, too, but but we have seen a lot of appreciation there. So, um, so yeah, so, we, you know, so we were thinking, you know, that will continue, just maybe not at the same pace, but Midwest markets too, you know, affordability being one reason. The other is there's a lot of investment going on in those markets, you know, uh, Chips Act and IRA, a lot of uh, manufacturing, uh, reshoring and things like that, bringing a lot of jobs. So, so uh, you know, expected appreciation there as well. Yeah, I um Phoenix and Las Vegas you mentioned, those were both uh much more resilient this year than I expected. Right, right. Um where where Austin was not, right? And and obviously did not find the bottom yet, but but Vegas did. Um and and Vegas is usually the highest volatility market, highest on the upside and, fa and fastest on the downside. Do you have any sense about why that was? Why, why Vegas and Phoenix maybe found a floor where Austin didn't? Right. I think those are continue to be uh, high growth, popu high population growth markets. Um, the other thing is we looked at um, income of people moving into those markets and differential between their income and income of local residents. And we found that in Phoenix and Vegas, for example, incoming residents uh, or incoming home buyers have as much as 50 to 60 percent higher incomes. And in an environment where you have constrained inventory, you know, that can really uh, put pressure on home prices. Uh, so I think that's one main one main one of the main reasons the Vegas, for example, I think also got became more diversified economically as a market. You know, it, it was mostly leisure and hospitality. I think now we see many more um, industries in that market and, you know, and, you know, um, you know, California's and, and West Coast is known to be moving out of the more expensive markets. And that's uh, one, you know, market that gains from 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 out, outbound, you know, from people moving out of California and, and Washington and Oregon. Uh, it's affordable. It's got a lot of new construction. Um, you know, it's it's got a lot of these type of jobs that, um, you know, just um, it's easy to transfer skills from, you know, one to the other. Right. They're not highly specialized markets, you know, where Austin, I think, is very high tech and we've seen some weaknesses in high tech sectors. So, you know, hence sort of um, impact on the housing market. Yeah, I, that's just my theory. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's I really like that. The, the inbound income differential um, is, I think, is uh, really notable for especially Vegas. Um, and, um, uh, and it was actually notable in Austin during the pandemic, but then, but with the tech correction, Austin, Austin obviously feels it more. That's, that's a great explanation. I appreciate that very much. Um, in the Midwest, uh, have you paid any attention to Indianapolis? Um, not specifically to Indianapolis, but generally the Midwest region. Yes. Yeah, so there are other parts of Midwest that have done really, really well over the last year or so. So, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and inventory is still at pandemic lows and, uh, and, um, prices are marching up and like those kind of things seem, uh, pretty, uh, impactful. I've noticed, I was having a conversation about Indianapolis recently about, um, was a strong year, but is right now Indianapolis and our data is topping the price reductions data, meaning Indianapolis is like showing some weaknesses in the in 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 the housing market, and I and I was curious if I'm looking for signals of why. I think it, Indianapolis benefited from, as you pointed out, the Chips Act and and the Inflation Reduction Act, and like there's a lot of investment happening, um, and so there was some good growth there. But but uh, it was interesting watching the cycle. So I'm just I'm just looking for signals here. 
Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. I, I think, you know, what's in many markets that are, you know, and, and we have a lot of inventory constrained markets, right? You have an issue with price discovery when you have such a constrained market. So prices tend to overshoot, you know, and every metro has sort of their income limit, right? Because, you know, Indianapolis is not going to be a metro where you have a lot of, you know, high income earners or you know, high income earners moving into that area. So there's almost like a ceiling, you know, and so when you reach that ceiling uh, for affordability, you'll see, you know, more price corrections. That's, uh, yeah, for sure. And, and maybe we, maybe that's exactly right. They're, they're feeling uh, that, that, um, the affordability acute uh, acutely at that moment in that moment there okay cool well that's that's super interesting um when we talk about the other things so we talked about the CoreLogic uh projection of of two to three percent home price gains for the year uh what other things for 2024 uh are you forecasting or should we pay attention big takeaways that we should pay attention to yeah, I think, uh, you know, that, that home sales forecast is, you know, it's a moving target <laughs> because mortgage rates have come down, you know, and, and so I'll say that the home sales forecast is very contingent on what happens with inventories. Some folks believe that inventories are going to rebound more than others, right? And, and I'm not, I am honestly, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this because I was fully convinced that, you know, that you won't get people moving if they have a 3% mortgage rates, you know, if, if, even if current mortgage rates come down to six or 5.8, um, you know, but maybe you would, you know, and, and the other thing is, you know, a lot of baby boomers have, uh, uh, own free and clear, right? So they're not, you know, dependent on that lock in, they're not locked in. Um, so, I, so I don't know. So I've been struggling with this idea of what happens with inventory. I mean, obviously, uh, we've seen some stabilization in terms of, you know, the, the drop off that we see at the end of the year in terms of new listings. We haven't seen as much of a drop off. So that's encouraging. So we may end up, in fact, seeing more home sales in 2024. Um, I mean, just over the last couple of weeks, I've been working, thinking about that, you know, but nevertheless, so the other thing that we do expect is more refis. Uh, obviously, there's been a quite a bit of buildup and refi potential uh, over the last year and a half with with mortgage rates being as, as high as they were. You know, I think we have over two million loans uh, that were originated over six and a half percent. So, you know, you know, whatever the breaking point for people is, so mortgages come to five, you know, to five handle, you know, you, you have refi potential building up there. Um, so we do see quite a bit of an increase in refi potential or in refis versus just overall um, purchase origination. So our overall origination forecast for next year is about 12% increase. And again, a lot of it coming from refis. Um, you know, uh, it, we're in the soft landing camp. You know, I think nothing at this point is telling us that there is, um, you know, a recession, imminent recession ahead. But, you know, there's always things to worry about. <laughs> we are economists, you know, economists always worry about everything, you know, so we, we worry. And, you know, there's concerns about, you know, commercial real estate. Uh, there's concerns about it's still the banking sector, you know, but all of these in a sense, dissipate as we get mortgage rates moving lower or it's to some extent dissipate, you know, so, so, you know, um, I do think mortgage rates will continue declining, uh, probably reach below 6% um, by the end of this year, you know, um, you know, if there is no surprises. I mean, I, I am concerned about the geopolitical situation right now, which could, you know, have impact on inflation. Um so I, I, I'm saying a lot here. I'm just keep That's, Those are terrific. Let me ask you about a couple of them. Okay. Um, mortgage originations, 12% increase this year is what you're, what you're forecasting. And that is both uh, an increase in the number of sales as well as an increase in, in um, refis, correct? Right. So um, uh, number of home sales is... Um, you think is maybe about eight or 10% more 
and and a couple percent of refis. How much of uh, how how do you look at home sales specifically for the year? Right. So in terms of origination, mortgage origination, we see an increase of two percent coming from or purchase originations increasing two percent, and then refis increasing sixty percent. Wow. Okay. So. Only a 2% increase in home sales, mortgage origination homes for home sales. For right, purchases. right. But I, 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 I'm, as I mentioned, I'm reevaluating that. <laughs> I see. Right. So I see because, as you pointed out, it looks like we have some easing of the inventory crisis, and therefore we would have some easing of uh, the sales volume. Like we're at a, in an inventory, a supply constrained market. Right, right, right. Okay, great. Well, I think you and I are well aligned on that. Um, measuring in the last um, six weeks, inventory climbing relative to last year, uh, each week, uh, each week a little more relative to last year. And so I think we are at about four and a half percent more homes on the market now as we start 2024 than we did the year before. So that's four and a half percent more that can sell. Um, and that's been growing. So it's been growing um, uh, gently. Uh, but I think, as you were saying, it's like s fewer and fewer people are, um, they are in their lock-in mindset. And so that's starting to ease out and, and having a few more people list their homes. So, Well, the other thing about purchases, too, is, you know, we've seen an increase in cash purchases. You know, that, mm -hmm. that share has been on the rise. And it really jumped at the end of last year. Um, to almost like I want to say 38 um, percent. So you know, you know, you know. So there could be more sales. It's just we're talking about purchase origina mortgage originations, right? Um, right? There could be more from cash purchases. That's really that's really um, interesting to hear you say because I, I we don't track mortgages. I don't track mortgages at, at Altos, but but um, but thinking about we can see the inventory climbing and we can watch. You know the new pendings each week, the new contracts getting signed is is climbing, inching up, right along with the um, with the, uh, the 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 inventory. In fact, in the New Year's week data, which is as we're recording this, the most recent data I have, uh, we have um, we had twenty percent more new contracts than a year ago. Same week a year ago, twenty percent. At like you know, most of the year we were. 10, 20, 30% fewer transactions. And so now we're starting on the other side. So that'll be interesting to see. You'll have to let me know if you revise your 2% your in, increase up because if that increases, if 2% increases, uh, you know, goes to like, I think we're probably at about a 10% year in terms, of new, in terms of new purchases. And we get the refis. Like that's a significant rebound for the mortgage business this year. Um, excellent. That's really interesting. Um, the, uh, the, the, let's then let's talk about, uh, broader economy. Now, you know, we all, of course we have, as you say, there's, there's always things to be worried about. Um, uh, I think, um, tell me, let's start there. Tell me what you're worried about. Well, I am worried about the geopolitical situation right now. I think it's scary what's going on. And I think, you know, you know, the, the, prospect of um the conflict spreading um it's that's you know that's really scary um and you know yeah anyways that's you know that one keeps me up actually does keep me up at night um but um you know the other things you know that are, well i guess that's the main one the other things obviously is the election coming and you know i i do worry about our um, rhetoric, you know, you know, political rhetoric, and just how does that impact, you know, so we also again now have this looming <laughs> um, debt ceiling situation, right? And so that actually does have, that could poten have a potential impact on, on mortgage rates, right? It does have impact on interest rates. Um, so just the lack of, um, you know, construct constructive conversation um, and, you know, how that feeds into the uh, economy overall that that worries me as well. Yeah. So let's talk about the election. People have been asking me lately, um, what is my take on uh, the election sort of direct impact on the housing market? And I think the underlying assumption is often that, um, 
you know, the politicians uh, aren't going to let the economy go into a recession because it's an election year and therefore they're going to save anything that might go wrong. Um, I have opinions on it, but I'm curious how you answer that question. What do you think? Is there an impact that we can expect from an election year on housing? Right. So let, well, let me put it this way. So, um, um, you know, there's differences in how the two different potential, two different administrations look at homeownership versus renter, uh, rent, rentership, right? And so, you know, the current administration has done a lot to incentivize, you know, to improve supply issues, particularly for Home, home ownership for owner occupied homes. And so, you know, they've been doing a lot to, to try to, you know, to spur up supply and, and also to ensure affordability and, and, and so on and so forth. In, on the flip side, you know, when you think about previous uh, or potentially next, you know, the other side of the story, right, is that that, that administration is more, um, more, you know, the policies are more favorable towards renter uh, rentership and investor incentives, you know, so that can be impact, um, you know, just basically access to homeownership, access to um, to credit as well. Um, so, you know, so that those could be some of the differences. The other is, you know, taxes as well. Um, if you recall, you know, SALT, um, state and local, uh, state and local tax deduction, uh, caps, you know, and, and also the mortgage interest deduction cap, uh, uh, dedu uh deduction cap had an impact on these, um, well, you know, there are, tend to be more blue states, but on these more expensive markets, you know, and so we've seen as a result of that some up migration, for example, out of California, uh, because these deduction caps do have an impact on middle income, um, you know, tax uh, bill. Um, and, and so, you know, so it could have, you know, so that could sort of play out in some way as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think those are the two main things that sort of tend to look at. Yeah. So there, there are, um, do we see anything in the pipeline? Like the salt tax was a big deal. Uh, yeah. And that was really interesting. It hit the middle income taxpayer in that sense. And, and do you, do, are, is there anything on the horizon or on your radar for this year? Um, I, I, uh, the debt ceiling, I think is an important one. Um, anything other of those or any of the policy changes that you've heard talked about that you think we should be paying attention to? Well, the one that I've been asked about is the one on about the hedge funds, you know, buying real estate, uh, rental properties. Um, you know, that's a, that's sort of been discussed for the last few years. And, um, you know, one thing, so I don't, I don't know how far that will go, but I, you know, I think different administration have, may have different takes on that, for example. Right. Um, so, so that could have an impact, but, um, you know, I, I do, um, you, you know, so I am concerned that, you know, the supply, you know, we need more supply. So whatever we do to incentivize that supply, it, it would be helpful, you know, long-term, short-term, it just would be, you know, for a more healthier housing market. Um, so, but you were asking me about something on a radar in terms of, yeah, I, I, so hedge funds, that, that would be one, what, what happens with that. Um, you know, there were some talks about doing some tax incentives for small investors, like, well, like, you know, mom and pop investors that own like two, three properties. And how do we sort of incentivize them to give up uh, some of that inventory towards more, uh, you know, ownership um, uh, inventory? Um you know, I mean, there's a lot of other things, uh, you know, manufactured housing is now been like a big topic too. Uh, so to what extent we have um, a credit um, mechanisms in place for people to purchase such housing, you know, because uh, before, you know, and, and I think Fannie Mae now has a program that, that helps people, you know, finance it on a 30 year fix with a 30 year fixed mortgage. So, you know, so all the ways in which we can uh, promote affordable home ownership and sustainable home ownership. Yeah. Right? Um, so um, those are great. And, and let me ask you. Um, so yeah, the hedge fund policy is really fascinating and it's, and actually 
compared to the individual investors, you know, it's something like 94% of, of investment properties in the U.S. are owned by the individuals. But of course, the, the hedge fund landlord is about as ready-made villain as, as we can, you know, you can make for central casting, you know, and so they get, of course, get a lot of the attention. Um, what is your opinion on the incentive? So for, I'm in, in particular, incentivizing individual investors to unload some of their properties and turn it back into resale inventory. Um, do you think that's smart? Do you think it's uh, could be effective? Do you think it's uh, crazy? What do you think about that? Well, you know, what I would say is that we should maybe put our efforts into building more <laughs> as opposed to, I mean, it's just moving around the same inventory. And our issue is not, you know, some people, you know, want to rent and, 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 and you know, are perfectly fine and their financial situation is such where, you know, they're better off renting. So I think we should focus much more on new building more, you know, and removing barriers to new construction. And, and so, and it's funny because it's, it's not an issue everywhere in the country. You know, some, some markets have plenty of new construction, but some markets are just can't get out of their own way. Uh, you know, so, so I think that's more important to me than, you know, how do we shift around who owns, you know, a, a property? Uh, the other thing, you know, about the hedge fund, you know, we've done a lot of analysis. We have a hedge, uh, sorry, we have investor, quarterly investor report. Uh, you know, they, they large institutional investors tend to own in like handful of markets, you know, because they need economies of scale to make this all work. And, and I just was reading a, a Wall Street Journal article on um, how they are actually building their own communities, right? Or they're, you know, in, investing in construction of new communities, that's all good because we need new homes, you know? Um, so yeah, I would just say that let's just uh, uh, widen the type and size and of homes and where we build. Great. Is there, I, I, I love that. I think it's, you know, we talk about hedge fund owners and individual owners and tax and things, and it's like, we just need to build some houses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, are there other insights in the quarterly investor report that um, takeaways that we should that are notable? Obviously, we've got like uh, concentration places like Tampa and and the suburban Atlanta and some of the, some of those places that have a lot of concentration. Are there, what other things should we know about the about real estate investors from that data? Right. So, you know, we break down the investors by size. So we have small, medium, large, and, and mega, I would be called. Um, you know, and actually the, the predominant, uh, activities among small and medium investors. So that's three to 10, uh, you know, and over 10, 10 to, I want to say 100 properties. But, but let's focus on these three to 10, because even when we look at that distribution of three to 10, which is a small investor, majority are in that three. Uh, you know, very, very small. And, and so, and in these markets where we are very, very constrained in terms of inventory, like California markets, that's where we see a lot of small investors, mom and pop investors. So, um, so, so that's an interesting takeaway. Um, you know, the other thing is we looked at, you know, is, is I buyer activity, but that's sort of been, that's an old story at this point, because it's, proven to be very difficult to, um, you know, to, to, um, you know, to, to forecast individual home prices, um, you know, um, so, so, you know, I buyers are, have not been very active or have not been active at all, basically since the middle of last two years ago. Those are great. Those are, those are terrific. That's all. Those are really interesting. And I think I'm happy um, to share the report with anybody who's interested. <laughs> great. Yeah. And, and in fact, we will, before we're done and in the show notes, we'll make sure we have your contact information. In fact, I'd love to see that report. I haven't, I don't think I've seen that one, uh, the quarterly one. So, um, that the investor report, uh, is really, it really be useful there. Um, uh, okay. Um, are there trends that you think are currently underemphasized in the media or like that the headlines have wrong right now? Are there things I always, I'm always interested in like, you know, like we have actual data and here's what I keep hearing. 
What is there anything like that that jumps out to you? Well, I I will say that um, if anything, everything feels like it's overemphasized in the, in the media. Um, you know, particularly the bad, like you know, bad always you know feeds the bad news always sort of stands on top. Um, you know, and and I and I would say throughout this whole year, I felt like. Um, the, the, the sentiment was, you know, when this other shoe, you know, there were, everybody was waiting for the other shoe to, to drop, you know, and, and recession is right around the corner and home prices are just about to fall off the, uh, you know, the cliff. Um, so that's been the sort of sentiment that sometimes I get from, from, you know, from media. Um, you know, and, but, and, and so the other thing is, you know, um, this disconnect that we have in terms of consumer sentiment and what's actually happening in the economy, you know, and consumers are so unhappy, you know, and then, but on the other side, you know, our, our economic growth has been incredible, particularly, you know, more recently, in, you know, the second part of last year. Um, and, and so you ask yourself, well, what's, what's the issue? And, and I think people are maybe, you know, maybe, maybe tired of, well, you know, we came out of recession, sorry, we came out of a pandemic and then we went into this inflation, you know, spiral and it felt that you were just sort of, um, you know, you, you know, everybody was out to get you everywhere you went, you know, whether that's your contractor because you had to fix something in your house or there was, you know, milk or egg prices. And, and I think people are, angry because of that but 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 that's not a true reflection of our economy because we you know we are really <clears throat> you know you know uh, um, our unemployment is the historical lows people are making more money real incomes are growing um you know so so there's so many positives out there but it's just that never sort of surfaces you know in in the in the media so that's yeah do you have a do you have the impact of that or do you see implications of that so we have this disconnect of um you know the economy that we're measuring and people's interpretation of the economy um are we seeing that translate into behavior well i mean i think it's going to impact the elections <laughs> which has a huge repercussions you know but the other thing is i think people are also very um well, they're negative on the housing market. If you look at the, you know, it, granted, I mean, there are a lot of things that are not good about the housing market, but but it's just, you know, if you look at survey after survey, people, you know, increasingly think it's a really bad time to buy. You know, is it really? I I, I don't know if you if you're in for a long term, if you have means, if you, you know, if you're what is it, ready, willing, and able, um, you know, and and you can find a home, you know, I. I, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I don't see that as, as, as being as bad, I guess, as, as, maybe as, the, as the broad mean. sentiment says, yeah. And it's yeah. funny how, you know, a bad time to buy, what does that mean? Well, it's a bad time to buy because inventory is low and I don't have a good selection. I have cash. I have, I have the need, but, but I don't have selection. That, that's a different kind of bad time to buy than I expect home prices to tank is a different kind of thing. Or it's bad, you know, because it was mortgage rates were, you know, dramatically lower two years ago. Um, uh, and, and so that, like, I, I always wonder what that, that means is, are they saying, well, it's bad for everybody else. I have a great deal, but it's bad for everybody else. <laughs> like, what? so I'm not sure what, what bad time to buy is, but it is notable that how many people think it's a bad time to buy, uh, homes. And, and I, mean, I still get questions from, you know, friends and, you know, acquaintances, you know, when are home prices going to fall? Cause I'm ready. I'm going to buy when home prices fall. <laughs> Yes. What a, you know, right. It's like the assumption is they must fall. They must and fall. Yeah. My, 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 you know, my response to that is, is, is the, like, you know, the crisis is what if they don't, right? Like now, well, what, what are we really going to worry about? Like, how do we in interpret what happens next? Um, that's, that's really great. Okay. I've got a couple, just a couple more sort of bigger picture questions for you. Um, 
uh, are there stuff you're doing at CoreLogic products or, you know, research or, you know, your investor reports or whatever that, uh, people should be paying attention to right now? Are there, are there cool things happening, um, that are, that we should have top of mind for us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are always doing a lot of innovative stuff. I think that's my you know favorite thing about CoreLogic is that because of the, um, depth of the data that we have, we're able to develop so many new solutions um, and, and insights. But, you know, one thing like last year, we, we released a climate risk analytics platform um, that leverages all of this, uh, you know, 360 view of a home uh, with, you know, overlay with climate, uh, climate data and sort of gives you um, you know, your risk profile. And it's turned out that people are paying more attention to that right now. Um, and so, so you know, you're thinking ahead sort of like, you know, well, you know, how is that going to play out in terms of geographic distribution of population and, 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 and home, home ownership and things like that? But um, the other thing is, you know, we, you know, AI and, and, and uh, machine learning obviously has been a big uh, word of 2023. And, and we've invested in a lot of uh, data analytics uh, to to um, you know to provide uh, valuable insights. So we have a lot of uh, predictive analytics um, that use these type of models. We have uh, you know AVM. Obviously, we have a, a risk management platform that also um, uses machine learning fraud detection. It also incorporates AI and ML. Um, so so you know geospatial analysis, for example, that's you know that's a big one, and that really fits fits well into this um, sort of risk and. And, um, you know, proximity, um, you know, proximity to risk, proximity to new development. We have a new growth development model. So basically, we're trying to identify new growth regions in the country uh, by looking at um you know, various data sources that we have. The cool thing at CoreLogic is we, you know, each property basically has a unique identifier through which you can uh, link all various disparate data sources about that property into like one profile, you know, so you can, that's what I mean by 360 views. So, you know, so that's enabled us to develop really cool uh, uh, in innovative solutions that, you know, everybody in this industry basically is looking at. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. Those are really neat. That's really neat stuff. The climate risk uh, analytics is, I think, potential is, 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 uh, obviously get, uh, growing in importance. And one place we see this is in insurance uh, costs in California, of course, Florida, but also places like Texas. And we can see those uh, really kicking in. And um, do you have a, any take on insurance costs and and um, maybe in the impact on the market or, or things like that, a climate risk and the impact on the, and on the market? Have, are we starting to measure things? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, that the question of rising insurance costs has been like, I think the top question of 2023 that I got. And, and it's very hard to measure it because it's, uh, well, it, you know, there's no publicly available data out there, right? And and it's and it's um, well. Anyways, the data itself, the actual insurance a premium as a data, um, you know, more uh, on a smaller geography is very hard to come by. So you have some state level data and things like that. The other thing is, as a fraction of overall uh, mortgage expense, it's not that high unless you live in these very hazard prone areas. It's not really, you know, if you're if you're sort of in the you know, well, anywhere where, you know, you don't have wildfires or hurricanes, you know, it's, it's a fraction of a cost. So, you know, I, I don't know, maybe $1,500 a year is an average premium at the moment, you know, and that's up from like 1200 a couple years ago. But if you are in wildfire area, like Napa, for example, and I, Thinking specifically in Napa, I just came from Napa. I spent Christmas there, and uh, you know, talked to a lot of friends there about their housing market. And basically, it's frozen because you cannot get insurance. <laughs> you know, and obviously, you know, you can't get insurance, you can't get a mortgage. So basically, only people with cash can buy and who are willing to take the risk and self-insure. Um, you know, or pay. You know, astronomical amounts for that insurance. 
Um, so, you know, so what does that mean long term for, you know, for, for these type of markets? And, but, you know, what we would, you know, we did some analysis in Coral, CoreLogic about, um, sort of, you know, mitigation, uh, ways of mitigating this and, and adaptive, um, modifications to home. And, and, you know, if you do, um, if you, you know, protect your house in a way, right? If you, you know, put, you know, fire resistant roof or, you know, you know, there's so many things you can do. And I, I don't even know to name them all, but basically if you do some, some of these things, it can uh, tr help tremendously. And, and basically what we saw in our data that homes that did uh, uh, do, do those upgrades that had relatively less, um, uh, um, uh, less increase in delinquency when a hazard happened, you know, so the delinquency rate was sh lower and they uh, recovered faster uh, following a disaster. So, so I think we'll see a lot of that happening, uh, you know, where people, where maybe, maybe, you know, local governments will be investing in those type of, uh, um, you know, modifications. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, yes, for sure. Okay. And, and, and I think it's a big deal. We may have to spend more time on insurance costs. And, um, I did a, uh, I did a podcast with a, with a company about, uh, who, um, is do, does the, the wildfire analytics and uh, like by, by property level, like interesting level stuff that, and, um, and so that's, uh, and I know that the, the climate risk, uh, platform that you guys are doing is really playing into that very strongly. I think, um, big deal for places like California. I'm in California, I'm in a house. You can't get insurance on the house that I'm sitting in right now. Uh, have to use a state backup plan. And, and, uh, it's like, it, and that was, I bought this one eight years ago. Um, so, okay. Selma, it's been terrific. Thank you so much for your view on uh, 2024, our review of 2023, all of the things that we get to see with the CoreLogic data. Um, uh, and where should people reach out to you? You mentioned the the, the investor report, but where, where should they follow you on LinkedIn? Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm most active on LinkedIn. I I sort of uh, there's too many platforms, right? <laughs> to, but I do do LinkedIn. I. I find it to be most useful. So that's where I post a lot of uh, our research. We, on our CoreLogic uh, website, we, ha we have intelligence uh, pay, part of the page where we post a lot of, not just uh, Office of Chief Economist, but all the uh, uh, groups in, in CoreLogic post their research. Um, so I would highly recommend folks uh, checking that out as well. Great, perfect. We'll make sure there are links for that for in the notes, everybody. And uh, everyone, thank you so much. This is the Top of Mind podcast. Selma Hep, thank you for joining us. Everyone, if you uh, find that you enjoy the podcast, I appreciate a review, a bunch of stars on wherever you get your podcast. That really helps other people find the podcast. So uh, thank you for those in advance. And, and we'll be back again in a week or two with another uh, episode of the, the Top of Mind podcast. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to Top of Mind. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate leaving a nice review on your favorite podcast app that helps other people find us as well. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. See you soon.